Jesus says, Lo, I stand at the door and knock. The Ausberg Confession, Part 1st, A.D. 1530, edited by Philip Melanchthon. Confession of Faith. Presented to the Invincible Emperor, Charles V, Caesar Augustus, at the Diet of Augsburg, A.D. 1530. I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings, and will not be ashamed. Psalm 119, verse 46. Preface to the Emperor Charles V. Most invincible emperor, Caesar Augustus, most clement master. Inasmuch as your imperial majesty has summoned a convention of the empire at Augsburg to deliberate in regard to aid against the Turk, the most atrocious, the hereditary, the ancient enemy of the Christian name and religion, in what way, to wit, resistance might be made to his rage and assaults by protracted and perpetual preparation for war. Because, moreover, of dissensions in the matter of our holy religion and Christian faith, and in order that in this matter of religion the opinions and judgments of diverse parties may be heard in each other's presence, may be understood and weighed among one another, in mutual charity, meekness, and gentleness, that those things which are in the writings on either side have been handled or understood amiss, being laid aside and corrected, these things may be harmonized and brought back to one simple truth and Christian concord, so that hereafter one unfeigned and true religion may be embraced and preserved by us, so that as we are subjects and soldiers of the one Christ, so also in unity and concord we may live in the one Christian church. And inasmuch as we, the elector and princes, whose names are subscribed together with others who are conjoined with us, in common with other electors and princes and states, have been called the aforenamed Diet, we have, in order to render most humble obedience to the imperial mandate, come early to Augsburg and, with no desire to boast, would state that we were among the very first to be present. When, therefore, your imperial majesty, among other things, has also at Augsburg, at the very beginning of these sessions, cause the proposition to be made to the princes and states of the empire that each of the states of the empire, in virtue of the imperial edict, should propose and offer in the German and in the Latin language its opinion and decision. After discussion on Wednesday, we replied to your imperial majesty that on the following Friday we would offer on our part the articles of our confession. Wherefore, in order that we may do homage to the will of your imperial majesty, we now offer in the matter of religion the confession of our preachers and of ourselves, the doctrine of which, derived from the holy scriptures and pure word of God, they have to this time set forth in our lands, dukedoms, domains, and cities, and have taught in the churches. If the other electors, princes, and states of the empire should, in similar writings, to wit, in Latin and German, according to the aforementioned imperial proposition, produce their opinions in this matter of religion, we here, in the presence of your imperial majesty, our most clement lord, offer ourselves, prepared in conjunction with the princes and our friends already designated, to compare views in a kindly manner in regard to mode and ways which may be available, so that, as far as may honorably be done, we may agree, and the matter between us of both parties being peacefully discussed, with no hateful contention, by God's help the dissension may be removed, and brought back to one true according to religion. As we are all subjects and soldiers under one Christ, so also we ought to confess one Christ, in accordance with the tenor of the decree of your imperial majesty. And all things should be brought back to the truth of God, with which most fervent prayers we beseech God to grant. But if, as regards to the rest of the electors, princes, and states, those of the other party, this treatment of the matter of religion, in the matter in which your imperial majesty has wisely thought fit it should be conducted and treated, to wit, with such mutual presentation of writings and calm conference between us, should not go on, nor be attended by any result, yet shall we leave a clear testimony that in no manner do we evade anything which can tend to promote Christian concord, anything which God and a good conscience allow, 
And this your imperial majesty and the other electors and states of the empire, and all who are moved by a sincere love of religion and concern for it, all who are willing to give an equitable hearing in this matter, will kindly gather and understand from the confession of ourselves and of ours. Since, moreover, your imperial majesty has not once only, but repeatedly signified to the electors, princes, and other states of the empire, and at the Diet of Spires, which was held in the year of our Lord, 1526, caused to be recited and publicly proclaimed, in accordance with the form of your imperial instruction and commission given and prescribed, that your imperial majesty in this matter of religion, for certain reasons, stated in the name of your majesty, was not willing to determine, nor was able to conclude touching anything, but that your imperial majesty would diligently endeavor to have the Roman pontiff, in accordance with his office, to assemble a general council. As also the same matter was more amply set forth a year ago in the last public convention, which was held at Spires, where through His Highness Ferdinand, King of Bohemia and Hungary, our friend and clement lord, afterward through the orator and the imperial commissioners, your imperial majesty, among other propositions, caused these to be made. That your imperial majesty had known and pondered the resolution to convene a council formed by the representatives of your imperial majesty in the empire, and by the imperial president and councillors, and by the legates of other states convened at Ratisbon, and this your imperial majesty also judged that it would be useful to assemble a council, and because the matters which were to be adjusted at this time between your imperial majesty and the Roman pontiff were approaching agreement and Christian reconciliation, your imperial majesty did not doubt that, but that the pope could be induced to summon a general council, Wherefore, your imperial majesty signified that your imperial majesty would endeavor to bring it to pass that the chief pontiff, together with your imperial majesty, would consent at the earliest opportunity to issue letters for the convening of such a general council. In the event, therefore, that in this matter of religion the difference between us and the other party should not be settled in friendship and love, we here present ourselves before your imperial majesty in all obedience, as we have done before ready to appear and to defend our cause in such a general, free, and Christian council, concerning the convening of which there has been concordant action and a determination by agreeing votes on the part of the electors, princes, and the other states of the empire, in all of the imperial diets which have been held in the reign of your imperial majesty. To this convention of a general council, as also to your imperial majesty, we have in the due method and legal form before made our protestation and appeal in the greatest and gravest of matters. To which appeal, both to your imperial majesty and a council, we still adhere. Nor do we intend, nor would it be possible for us to forsake it by this or any other document, unless the matter between us and the other party should, in accordance with the tenor of the latest imperial citation, be adjusted, settled, and brought to Christian concord, in friendship and love, concerning which appeal we here also make our solemn and public protest. Part First Chief Articles of Faith Article 1 of God The churches, with common consent among us, do teach that the decree of the Nicene Synod concerning the unity of the divine essence and of the three persons is true, and without doubt to be believed, to wit, that there is one divine essence which is called and is God, eternal, without body, indivisible, without part, of infinite power, wisdom, goodness, the creator and preserver of all things, visible and invisible, and that yet there are three persons of the same essence and power who also are co-eternal, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and they use the name of person in that signification in which the ecclesiastical writers, the fathers, have used it in this cause, to signify not a part or quality in another, but that which properly subsists. They condemn all heresies which have sprung up against this article, as the Manichees, who set down two principles, good and evil, in the same manner as the Valentinians, Arians, Eunomians, Mohammedans, and all such like. They condemn also the Samosatines, old and new, who, when they earnestly contend that there is but one person, do craftily and wickedly trifle, after the manner of rhetoricians, about the Word and Holy Ghost, that they are not distinct persons, 
but that the word signifieth a vocal word, and the spirit a motion created in things. Article 2 of Original Sin Also they teach that, after Adam's fall, all men begotten after the common cause of nature are born with sin, that is, without the fear of God, without trust in him, and with fleshly appetite, and that this disease or original fault is truly sin, condemning and bringing eternal death now also upon all that are not born again by baptism and the Holy Spirit. They condemn the Pelagians and others who deny this original fault to be sin indeed, and who, so as to lessen the glory of the merits and benefits of Christ, argue that a man may, by the strength of his own reason, be justified before God. Article 3 of the Son of God Also they teach that the Word, that is, the Son of God, took unto him man's nature in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, so that there are two natures, the divine and the human, inseparably joined together in unity of person, one Christ, true God and true man, who was born of the Virgin Mary, truly suffered, was crucified, dead, and buried, that he might reconcile the Father unto us, and might be a sacrifice not only for original guilt, but also for all actual sins of men. The same also descended into hell, and truly rose again the third day. Afterward he ascended into the heavens, that he might sit at the right hand of the Father, and reign for ever, and have dominion over all creatures, might sanctify those that believe in him by sending the Holy Spirit into their hearts, who shall rule, sanctify, purify, strengthen, comfort, and quicken them, and shall defend them against the devil and the power of sin. The same Christ shall openly come again to judge the quick and the dead, according as the Apostles' Creed declareth these and other things. Article 4 of Justification Also they teach that men cannot be justified, obtain forgiveness of sins and righteousness, before God by their own powers, merits, or works, but are justified freely of grace, for Christ's sake through faith, when they believe that they are received into favor and their sins forgiven for Christ's sake, who by his death hath satisfied for our sins. This faith doth God impute for righteousness before him. Romans chapter 3 and 4. Article 5 of the Ministry of the Church. For the obtaining of this faith, the ministry and teaching, the gospel, and administering the sacraments was instituted. For by the word and sacraments, as by instruments, the Holy Spirit is given, who worketh faith, where and when it pleaseth God, in those that hear the gospel, to wit, that God, not for our merits' sake, but for Christ's sake, doth justify those who believe that they for Christ's sake are received into favor. They condemn the Anabaptists and others who imagine that the Holy Spirit is given to men without the outward word through their own preparations and works. Article 6 of New Obedience Also they teach that this faith should bring forth good fruits, and that men ought to do the good works commanded of God, because it is God's will, and not on any confidence of meriting justification before God by their works. For remission of sins and justification is apprehended by faith, as also the voice of Christ witnesseth. When ye have done all these things, say, we are unprofitable servants. The same also do the ancient writers of the church teach. For Ambrose saith, This is ordained of God, that he that believeth in Christ shall be saved without works, by faith alone, freely receiving remission of sins. Article 7 of the Church also they teach that one holy church is to continue forever. But the church is the congregation of saints, the assembly of all believers, in which the gospel is rightly taught, purely preached, and the sacraments rightly administered, according to the gospel. And unto the true unity of the church it is sufficient to agree concerning the doctrine of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments, nor is it necessary that human traditions, rites, or ceremonies instituted by men should be alike everywhere, as St. Paul saith, there is one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Article 8. What the Church is. Though the Church be properly the congregation of saints and true believers, yet seeing that in this life many hypocrites and evil persons are mingled with it, it is lawful to use the sacraments administered by evil men, according to the voice of Christ, 
Matthew chapter 23, verse 2. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. And the words following. And the sacraments and the word are effectual by reason of the institution and commandment of Christ, though they be delivered by evil men. They condemned the Donatists and such like, who denied that it was lawful to use the ministry of evil men in the church, and held that the ministry of evil men is useless and without effect. Article 9 of Baptism Of baptism they teach that it is necessary to salvation, and that by baptism the grace of God is offered, and that children are to be baptized, who by baptism, being offered to God, are received into God's favor. They condemn the Anabaptists, who allow not the baptism of children, and affirm that children are saved without baptism. Article 10 of the Lord's Supper Of the Supper of the Lord they teach that the true body and blood of Christ are truly present under the form of bread and wine, and are, there, communicated to those that eat in the Lord's Supper and received. And they disapprove of those who teach otherwise, wherefore also the opposite doctrine is rejected. Article 11 of Confession Concerning confession, they teach that private absolution be retained in the churches, though enumeration of all offenses be not necessary in confession, for it is impossible, according to the psalm, who can understand his errors. Article 12 of Repentance Touching repentance, they teach that such as have fallen after baptism may find remission of sins at what time they are converted, whenever they come to repentance, and that the church should give absolution unto such as return to repentance. Now repentance consisteth properly of these two parts. One is contrition, or terror stricken into the conscience through the acknowledgment of sin. The other is faith, which is conceived by the gospel, or absolution, and doth believe that for Christ's sake sins be forgiven, and comforteth the conscience, and freeth it from terrors, then should follow good works, which are the fruits of repentance. They condemn the Anabaptists, who deny that men once justified can lose the Spirit of God, and do contend that some men may attain to such a perfection in this life that they cannot sin. Here are rejected those who teach that those who have been once holy cannot fall again. The Novatians are also condemned who would not absolve such as had fallen after baptism, though they returned to repentance. They also that do not teach that remission of sin is obtained by faith, and who command us to merit grace by satisfactions are rejected. Article 13. Of the Use of Sacraments Concerning the use of the sacraments, they teach that they were ordained not only to be marks of profession among men, but rather that they should be signs and testimonies of the will of God towards us, set forth unto us to stir up and confirm faith in such as use them. Therefore men must use sacraments so as to join faith with them, which believes the promises that are offered and declared unto us by the sacraments. Wherefore they condemn those who teach that the sacraments do justify by the work done, and do not teach that faith which believes the remission of sins is requisite in the use of sacraments. Article 14 of Ecclesiastical Orders Concerning ecclesiastical orders, church government, they teach that no man should publicly in the church teach or administer the sacraments, except he be rightly called, without a regular call. Article 15 of Ecclesiastical Rites Concerning ecclesiastical rites, made by men, they teach that those rites are to be observed which may be observed without sin, and are profitable for tranquility and good order in the church, such as are set holidays, feasts, and the like. Yet concerning such things, men are to be admonished that consciences are not to be burdened as if such service were necessary to salvation. They are also to be admonished that human traditions, instituted to propitiate God, to merit grace and make satisfaction for sins, are opposed to the gospel and the doctrine of faith. Wherefore, vows and traditions concerning foods and days and such like, instituted to merit grace and make satisfaction for sins, are useless and contrary to the gospel. Article 16 of Civil Affairs Concerning civil affairs, they teach that such civil ordinances as are lawful are good works of God, that Christians may lawfully bear civil office, sit in judgments, determine matters by the imperial laws, and other laws in present force appoint just punishments, engage in just war, act as soldiers, make legal bargains and contracts, 
hold property, take an oath when the magistrates require it, marry a wife, or be given in marriage. They condemn the Anabaptists who forbid Christians these civil offices. They condemn also those that place the perfection of the gospel not in the fear of God and in faith, but in forsaking civil offices, inasmuch as the gospel teacheth an everlasting righteousness of the heart. In the meantime, it doth not disallow order and government of commonwealths or families, but requireth especially the preservation and maintenance thereof, as of God's own ordinances, and that in such ordinances we should exercise love. Christians, therefore, must necessarily obey their magistrates and laws, save only when they command any sin, for then they must rather obey God than men. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Article 17 of Christ's Return to Judgment. Also they teach that, in the consummation of the world, at the last day, Christ shall appear to judge and shall raise up all the dead, and shall give unto the godly and elect eternal life and everlasting joys. But ungodly men and the devils shall he condemn unto endless torments. They condemn the Anabaptists who think that to condemned men and the devils shall be an end of torments. They condemn others also, who now scatter Jewish opinions, that, before the resurrection of the dead, the godly shall occupy the kingdom of the world, the wicked being everywhere suppressed. The saints alone, the pious, shall have a worldly kingdom, and shall exterminate all the godless. Article 18 of Free Will Concerning free will, they teach that man's will has some liberty to work a civil righteousness, and to choose such things as reason can reach unto but that it hath no power to work the righteousness of God, or spiritual righteousness, without the Spirit of God, because that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. But this is wrought in the heart when men do receive the Spirit of God through the Word. These things are, in as many words, affirmed by St. Augustine. We confess that there is in all men a free will, which hath indeed the judgment of reason, not that it is thereby fitted without God, either to begin or to perform anything in matters pertaining to God, but only in works belonging to this present life, whether they be good or evil. By good works I mean those which are of the goodness of nature, as to will to labor in the field, to desire meat or drink, to desire to have a friend, to desire apparel, to desire to build a house, to marry a wife, to nourish cattle, to learn the art of diverse good things, to despise any good thing pertaining to this present life, all of which are not without God's government. Yea, they are, and had their beginning from God and by God. Among evil things I account such as these, to will to worship an image, to will manslaughter and such like. They condemn the Pelagians and others who teach that by the power of nature alone, without the Spirit of God, We are able to love God above all things, also to perform the commandments of God as touching the substance of our actions. For although nature be able in some sort to do the external works, for it is able to withhold the hands from theft and murder, yet it cannot work the inward motions, such as the fear of God, trust in God, chastity, patience, and such like. Article 19 of the Cause of Sin Touching the cause of sin, they teach that, although God doth create and preserve nature, yet the cause of sin is the will of the wicked, to wit, of the devil and ungodly men, which will, God not abiding, turneth itself from God, as Christ saith. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. John chapter 8, verse 44. Article 20 of Good Works Ours are falsely accused of forbidding good works, For their writings extant upon the Ten Commandments and others of the like argument do bear witness that they have to good purpose taught concerning every kind of life and its duties, what kinds of life and what works in every calling do please God, of which things preachers in former times taught little or nothing, only they urged certain childish and needless works, as keeping of holidays, set fasts, fraternities, pilgrimages, worshipping of saints, the use of rosaries, monkery, and such things whereof our adversaries, having had warning, they do now unlearn them, and do preach concerning these unprofitable works, as they were wont. Besides, they begin now to make mention of faith, concerning which there was formerly a deep silence. They teach that we are not justified by works alone, but they conjoin faith and works, and say we are justified by faith and works, 
which doctrine is more tolerable than the former one and can afford more consolation than their old doctrine. Whereas, therefore, the doctrine of faith, which should be the chief one in the church, hath been so long unknown, as all men must needs grant, that there was the deepest silence about the righteousness of faith in their sermons, and that the doctrine of works was usual in the churches. For this cause our divines did thus admonish the churches. First, that our works cannot reconcile God, or deserve remission of sins, grace, and justification at his hands, but that these we obtain by faith only, when we believe that we are received into favor for Christ's sake, who alone is appointed mediator and propitiary, by whom the Father is reconciled. He, therefore, that trusteth by his works to merit grace, doth despise the merit and grace of Christ, and seeketh by his own power, without Christ, to come unto the Father. Whereas Christ hath said expressly of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John chapter 14, verse 6. This doctrine of faith is handled by Paul almost everywhere. By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And lest any here should cavil, we bring in a new found interpretation. This whole cause is sustained by testimonies of the fathers. Augustine doth in many volumes defend grace and the righteousness of faith, against the merit of works. The like doth Ambrose teach in his book, De Vocatione Gentium, and elsewhere, for this he saith of the calling of the Gentiles, the redemption made by the blood of Christ would be of small account, and the prerogative of man's works would not give place to the mercy of God, if the justification which is by grace were due to merits going before, so as it should not be the liberality of the giver, but the wages or hire of the laborer. This doctrine, though it be condemned of the unskillful, yet godly and fearful consciences find by experience that it bringeth very great comfort, because the consciences cannot be quieted by any works, but by faith alone, when they believe assuredly that they have a God who is propitiated for Christ's sake, as St. Paul teacheth. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. This doctrine doth wholly belong to the conflict of a troubled conscience, and cannot be understood but where the conscience hath felt that conflict. Wherefore all such as have had no experience thereof, and all that are profane men, who dream that Christian righteousness is naught else but a civil and philosophical righteousness, are poor judges of this matter. Formerly men's consciences were vexed with the doctrine of works. They did not hear any comfort out of the gospel, whereupon conscience drove some into the desert into monasteries, hoping there to merit grace by a monastical life. Others devised other works whereby to merit grace and to satisfy for sin. There was very great need, therefore, to teach and renew this doctrine of faith in Christ, to the end that fearful consciences might not want comfort, but might know that grace and forgiveness of sins and justification are received by faith in Christ. Another thing which we teach men is that in this place the name of faith doth not only signify a knowledge of the history which may be in the wicked and in the devil, but it signifieth a faith which believeth, not only the history but also the effect of the history, to wit, the article of remission of sins, namely, that by Christ we have grace, righteousness, and remission of sins. Now he that knoweth that he hath the Father merciful to him through Christ, this man knoweth God truly. He knoweth that God hath care of him. He loveth God, and calleth upon him. In a word, he is not without God, as the Gentiles are. For the devils and the wicked can never believe this article of the remission of sins, and therefore they hate God as their enemy. They call not upon him. They look for no good thing at his hands. After this manner doth Augustine admonish the reader touching the name of faith, and teacheth that this word faith is taken in scriptures, not for such a knowledge as is in the wicked, but for a trust which doth comfort and lift up disquieted minds. Moreover, ours teach that it is necessary to do good works, not that we may trust that we deserve grace by them, but because it is the will of God that we should do them. By faith alone is apprehended remission of sins and grace. And because the Holy Spirit is received by faith, our hearts are now renewed and so put on new affections, so that they are able to bring forth good works. For thus saith Ambrose, Faith is the begetter of a good will and of good actions. 
For man's powers without the Holy Spirit are full of wicked affections and are too weak to perform any good deed before God. Besides, they are the devil's power who driveth men forward into diverse sins, into profane opinions, and into heinous crimes, as was to be seen in the philosophers who, a saying to live an honest life, could not attain unto it, but were defiled with many heinous crimes. Such is the weakness of man when he is without faith and the Holy Spirit, and hath no other guide but the natural powers of man. Hereby every man may see that this doctrine is not to be accused as forbidding good works, but rather is much to be commended, because it showeth after what sort we must do good works. For without faith the nature of man can by no means perform the works of the first or second table. Without faith it cannot call upon God, hope in God, bear the cross, but seeketh help from man, and trusteth in man's help. So it cometh to pass that all lusts and human counsels bear sway in the heart so long as faith and trust in God are absent. Wherefore also Christ saith, Without me ye can do nothing, John chapter 15, verse 5, and the church singeth, Without thy power is not in man, not that is innocent. Article 21 of Worship of Saints Touching the worship of saints, they teach that the memory of saints may be set up before us, that we may follow their faith and good works according to our calling, as the emperor may follow David's example in making war to drive away the Turks from his country, for either of them is a king. But the scripture teacheth not to invocate saints, or to ask help of saints, because it propoundeth unto us one Christ, the mediator, propitiary, high priest, and intercessor. This Christ is to be invocated, and he hath promised that he will hear our prayers, and liketh this worship especially, to wit, that he be invocated in all afflictions. If any man sin, we have an advocate with God, Christ Jesus the righteous. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. Article 22. This is about the sum of doctrine among us, in which can be seen that there is nothing which is discrepant with the scriptures, or with the church Catholic, or even with the Roman church, so far as that church is known from writers, the writings of the fathers. This being the case, they judge us harshly who insist that we shall be regarded as heretics. But the dissension is concerning certain traditions and abuses, which, without any certain authority, have crept into the churches, in which things, even if there were some difference, yet it would be a becoming lenity on the part of the bishops that, on account of the confession which we have now presented, they should bear with us, since not even the canons are so severe as to demand the same rights everywhere, nor were the rights of all churches at any time the same. Although among us, in large part, the ancient rites are diligently observed. For it is a calumnious falsehood that all the ceremonies, all the things instituted of old, are abolished in our churches. But the public complaint was that certain abuses were connected with the rites in common use. These, because they could not with good conscience be approved, have to some extent been corrected. <laughs>